And this one is a hard one. Like after you met the pain with like acceptance, compassion, and just like after you met the raw reality of how you are feeling, or not the stories you're telling yourself about the pain, but how you are really feeling. And then you ask yourself, what can I take responsibility for? And people do not realize expectations are weights. And the more that we take on, especially those imposed on us from other people or the culture, the more pressure we feel, the more stressed out we Remember, feel. Remember, so much of what defines a great performer in the world, in your industry, in the medical community, in the pharmaceutical community, in the flooring community, in the athletic world, in the special operations community, is not what he or she does, it's what they're willing not to do. And, and I, I go back to um, you saying about addressing the feelings of like you want to smoke or drink or indulge in bad food or watch porn or whatever it is. Yeah. You were saying about curiosity about the feelings you have then before you take that action. Absolutely. That's helpful. That's absolutely helpful. Usually what I get people to do is like, hold your cigarette. You know, it's just like, hold your cigarette. And, you know, you have the lighter in your hand, the cigarette is there. Within a second, you can turn, you can light up the cigarette and smoke. Tell me what is going on in your body. So, because very often we are at this space where we are separated between mind and body. And they are trying to reconnect. And every time they are trying to reconnect because the body is wired for coherence. The body is wired for wholeness. This is the reason when when this is the reason why when you hurt yourself, the white cells are jumping over there. They are just like, you know, integrity breach. We need to heal the body, emotional, mental, spiritual, ethereal, or physical body is wired for wholeness. So very often when we are in traumatic situations and we do not know how to meet or to navigate a specific emotion, we suppress it, we try to cope. And then at some point in time, when the the factor, when the environment is not the safe, the same anymore, when the person that used to make you feel unsafe is not there anymore, when there is a little bit more safety, the body is going to call you through triggers usually. And very often people have their ways to navigate their triggers. Okay, they're going to smoke. Okay, they're going to do something. They set, um, very often people that have porn addiction, they sexualize a charge that they don't know how to process. And literally when they have that orgasm um, happening, this is the way to discharge that emotional thing that was in there. So every time they feel it, this, they, they have that association and they sexualize that charge. And when they go, when they watch porn, for example, they allow themselves to release it. And so many other people is going to be through something else. So just becoming present with the emotion, which is the charge, becoming present with that, feeling all of it, allowing yourself even to ask yourself, where did I feel this way before? And this might require the help of a facilitator if you're not really skilled at navigating your, your own emotions. But just that simple fact of feeling your emotion and validating the way you feel. Oh, I'm feeling extremely anxious right now for this and this or this reason. There is something that was said. There is something that I saw. There is something that I observed that made me feel this anxiety. And so it's not... It, and that's okay. Just that validation of the emotional states, it creates you to, it, it, gets, it gets you to a place where you feel a little bit of relief. And there's several, several different emotional states, I would think, that would lead to the addiction. So anxiety, you know, you may want to smoke, but there's other feelings, right, that could uh, Absolutely. trigger the need for addiction. And very often, the feelings that will lead you there are the feelings that you were modeled model the least how to navigate in a healthy way. Mm. A lot of cases for men and for, you know, it's like anger. Anger is bad. Anger is terrible. Like this association of anger with aggression. And, you know, uh, somebody that was raised well doesn't want, to, doesn't want to be aggressive. But if I created that identification 
anger equals aggression. And when something does something that somebody does something that makes me feel that anger, I don't want to be aggressive. So I need to do something. Maybe I'm going to smoke and that's going to work. And for some other people, it might be just shame. They don't know how to navigate shame. They just create that uh, that meaning. I am flawed. I am wrong. There's something wrong with me. I don't want to feel that way. I'll never amount to anything. And, you know, they I am bad. Like Brené Brown says, you know, shame is telling yourself you are bad. You are there's something broken inside. So they don't want to deal with that. They're not modeled how to navigate these emotions. So they're going to rely on something so that they don't have to face the emotion. Mm -hmm. And very often it's like, it takes the practice of first emotional intelligence, learning to emotionally regulate, which is also that new aspect of reparenting, learning to emotionally regulate, learning to even be present with your emotions, learning to work with them because they are a, they are just a natural they they play such a central role in the in the human experience you can't get away from feeling as long as you are human so learning how to work through your emotions with more grace with more ease is really really necessary and you don't have to rely anymore on like external things in order to get you to that place of regulation because in my experience when we rely when we use addiction when we use all of these things it's because we need to regulate and when we are able to get to that place where you're going to see some people they have such a deep level of ease creating new habits boom 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 this it's set in place and they can move forward they miss one day, maybe they're not going to beat themselves too, too much for it. You know, next day I'm back on track, back to it. And some other people, they miss one day. It's a shame storm, shame spiral, yeah. mm -hmm. shame you spiral. know, and therefore they can't get back on track. It would take them a week, two weeks, maybe a month to feel better about themselves enough in order to get back on track, whatever that track is. And it, and, it, and it perpetuates the addiction cycle. That's all you're doing is adding to it. Um, Kelsey's going to have a lot of, I think, a lot of questions for you because mm -hmm. Kelsey and her mom are the ones who introduced us to you or to me to you, and they've been following you for some time. So, Kelsey? My, I just have one that you mentioned earlier that both Kevin and I were like... <gasps> <laughs> and we had goes, a lot of those moments. <laughs> but this one, it goes back to empaths and codependent people. And I think this is going to relate a lot to our audience. And you talked yeah. about self-love deficit disorder. Can yes. you talk more about that and talk about, for us who probably have that, how yes. we can, like, what steps can we take to help that? That's really interesting. Um, and yes, the first thing that I want to say here is mostly for people that have high degree of codependency. There is that self-love deficit disorder. And um, there is a psychologist that I, I'm, I'm, I love her work. That's how she labels it. Um, the first thing that I would like to say is very often we have this tendency to disown parts of ourselves to disown the way that we are looking at ourselves in my experience radical self-acceptance for exactly where you are is the first step mm. to you know to deep transformation like just radical self-acceptance like oh i'm seeing this pattern that i have just being observing of that pattern rather than shaming yourself for this pattern is really important. And I'm sorry, I'm going to come back with the word shame over and over and over because it had just been anchored in the consciousness of people and people that have a very low level, like self-love deficit disorder. And I, I don't want to use it as a new label, but it's just like, it's truly a self-love deficit. They are just so... Uh, they just work with shame all the time. They are just constantly shaming themselves, constantly putting themselves down in order to look for any degree of like approval, belonging or whatever, you know? So just meeting yourself where you are in my experience is the first step. Like 
very often I would invite people to make the inventory of all their own traits that they would shame themselves for. Like this, I hate the fact that I am feeling powerless or I'm feeling this and I'm feeling this and I'm feeling this and I'm feeling this. And I asked them to respond. And this is what a mentor of mine gave me at some point in time. And I love that. Or, and that's okay. Like this is a pattern of mine that is just disturbing me so much. And I love that. Or, and that's okay. Or I release the need to shame myself for that. I release the need to belittle myself for that. I release the need to see myself as broken because of it. I release the need you know, to see myself as less than because of it, which is the way you begin to engineer acceptance. There is no self-love without acceptance. The question that I usually invite people is, can you truly say that you love your joy as much as you love your pain? And when you are not at that level, you are just the fair weather friend to yourself. Can you be at a place where you are present and accepting of yourself when you are in pain as much as you are present and accepting of yourself when you are just killing it. Joyful, present, happy. Can you truly be at that place? And for so many people that are struggling with like codependent behaviors is they are not willing to be friends with themselves when they are in pain and they are there a lot of the time. They are rejecting these aspects of themselves and they would rather shame themselves for it. And they stay in that small spiral. I feel bad and I hate myself for it. I feel bad and I hate myself for it. I feel this way and I hate myself for it. And therefore there is no sustainable change that is happening in there. But when you get to a place where you are able to meet your pain with a little bit more acceptance, and acceptance here is not complacency. Acceptance doesn't mean I am not doing something to change it. Acceptance is I am seeing it for what it is. And I am willing in this moment to allow it to be what it is for now. I'm seeing it for what it is. And Instead of rejecting its nature, I am choosing to see it for what it is, and that's okay. And as I am allowing myself to see it for what it is, then I get to still do something about it. It doesn't mean that I'm going to get complacent and accept it as my nature, but I just see it for what it is, which is me hurting and not me being bad. Whenever we create a narrative uh, on top of the pain that we are feeling, we are anchoring suffering. I am hurting and I am bad are two different things. I am hurting is data, this is how you're feeling. I am a victim because I'm hurting is a story that you created. I am hurting is data, which is a state of emotional pain that you're acknowledging. I am a victim, you added a storyline on top of it. So getting to a place where you accept the the emotional data at plain value, I feel sadness, I am hurting, I am experiencing this, is the first thing. And really meeting that pain without adding a narrative, like I will never be loved, I will end up being alone all the time. And very often when I've worked with people that, are extremely codependent. This is the narrative. I'll end up alone. I just gonna be. I'm just gonna be alone my whole life. I'm gonna be abandoned once again. This is the narrative. So when you are willing to meet that and strip the pain from all the stories, when you're willing to strip the pain from the stories, you can fully alchemize that pain. So that first step of acceptance and radical honesty means meeting the raw expression of the pain and not creating a story, not creating a narrative. If you create a narrative, you might not be fully radically honest because it is the, the emotional experience is biased by your interpretation. And interpretations can, they can be off at some point in time. And this one is a hard one. 
like after you met the pain with like acceptance, compassion, and just like after you met the raw reality of how you are feeling, or not the stories you're telling yourself about the pain, but how you are really feeling. And then you ask yourself, what can I take responsibility for? This is the question that brings you back to a place of choice. This is a question that brings you back to a place of feeling empowered. This is the question that brings you back to a place of feeling like you have the capacity to choose your experience, which is what can I take responsibility for? I take responsibility for the way I behaved. I take responsibility for the way I showed up. I take responsibility for the expectations that I didn't say. I take responsibility for the needs that I didn't um, completely vocalize. I take responsibility for the, the boundaries that were missing. I take responsibility for this, 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 and that. And taking responsibility for, and for anything brings you at a place where, okay, if I take responsibility, I'm also taking the power to change at the same time. This is what taking responsibility gives you. Taking responsibility doesn't mean taking the blame. It also gives you the power to change. So meeting that pain, and I often say meeting the victim with compassion is the first step because you get to that place where you meet the part of yourself and you're just like, I'm sorry this happened. I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry this was hurtful. Are you willing to come along with me? I'm taking responsibility for this, 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 and this. And therefore, because I'm taking responsibility for all of that, it is in my hand, meaning it's something that I can mold into a new expression of power. Taking responsibility also gives you power to change. You cannot change a story that you disown. When you take responsibility for the story, when you take ownership to a certain degree for the story, you have the capacity to change. You have the capacity to rewrite the story. And very often when I work with people that have a really low level of like self-love and they are very codependent, very often their needs are not spoken. Very often the boundaries are not clear. Very often they have expectations that are not spoken. Very often they are holding on to disappointment that they're not going to voice. Very often they are, they are suppressing their voice to a certain degree. Very often they have desires that they are not even going to allow themselves to speak into existence because they feel like they shouldn't be taking a lot of space. And very often behind it, there is just a child that went through a deep amount of emotional neglect. And that emotional neglect, when you are willing to work through it, it gives you the possibility to feel more empowered, to show up differently in your life. So emotional neglect for people that are highly codependent because they needed to caretake, they needed to do something in order to receive love in, re in return. That love wasn't just handed to them by a loving caregiver. They needed them to do something, to behave in a certain way, to receive love. Working through that emotional neglect is very important in order to feel empowered again. And people do not realize expectations are weights. And the more that we take on, especially those imposed on us from other people or the culture, the more pressure we feel, the more stressed out we feel. So the reason why I wanted to write this book is to shine a light on what expectations are and then really give tips and tools on how to deal with them. Because if we don't deal with our expectations, if we don't manage our expectations, then they're going to manage us. And one of the reasons why most of us may not be happy is because there are expectations that we have not yet managed and set. You know, and this, this is going to sound, this is not crazy and off topic. And, um, you know, I, as, as I hear more criticism of, of capitalism come along. And when I was young, I just understood, you know, my generation was communism, Soviet Union, bad, capitalism, America, good. And it was simple and easy. It was my Disney view. But then as I've gotten older, uh, you know, so there have been people who've educated me on sometimes like that, you know, when you're in a society of like, have more, need more, uh, you know, you have these expectations. I have to be this successful, like, right? So, so th th that kind of plays into it too, would you say? Absolutely. I, I have a section in the book called cultural expectations. And in that section, I deal with the very thing that you're hitting on is that a lot of times if we just stop and think, 
And I asked this question in the book, are you really living the life that you want? And in my experience, from the people that come to me for help, most people are not living their actual life. They're living a life for someone else. So to your point, you know, in a, in a capitalistic society, the idea is that more is always better. So if I don't have more, then there's something wrong. And that's actually not true. And but what happens is you, if, if you're not careful, you take that expectation from the culture and then you use it as a barometer to judge yourself good or bad. And, and the problem is that that means you are not living free. I'm not living free if I allow the culture to set the expectation that I live by. Oh my I, and my, I and myself, you and yourself, should be the only one to have the power to set the expectation that you live by. It doesn't mean that we can't agree with some expectations for the culture. We can agree with whatever expectation we That's get. That's right. Or align with them. Yeah. That's right. But it has to be our choosing, not because we feel obligated that we won't become we need to be if we don't and and so in the book we talk about or oh, you well, we i'm taking ownership it, <laughs> uh, this personal cultural relational and professional so let let's talk yeah. about the personal expectations okay like you know where where do they stem from yeah personal expectations you know stem from uh you know one just who we are right and who we want to be and a lot of times these personal expectations come from our dreams and our aspirations and there's nothing wrong to have dreams there's nothing wrong with aspirations however in the personal section of the book i lay the foundation for how to set expectations if you want your expectations to be set you got to ask two questions one is the expectation realistic or unrealistic how do you know is it within your control to do it I believe that whatever is within your control is a realistic expectation. If anything is outside of your control, it is unrealistic to expect. And the second question to set your expectation, if it involves someone else, you have to ask the question, is it spoken or unspoken? Meaning, does it need to be communicated? And until you ask these two questions, your expectations are, are unset. And in order to set them personally, you've got to know what's in your control and what needs to be communicated. Okay, so let's talk about let's talk about one. And what can you give me examples of what's in our control that's relatable to the audience and then sure. what, what you would deem or could deem not in our control. Yeah, so in a very, you know, basic sense, what's in my control is me. What's out of my control is you. So often, most of our frustration, our anger, our resentment, our disappointment, our bitterness is because we're trying to control people that we have no control over. I don't care if, if you're married to them. I don't care if they birthed you. I don't care if you birthed them. We have no control over someone outside of us. So just having that revelation can shine a whole light on a whole lot of things. I only control me. Now, I can influence, I can inspire others, I can motivate, but I can't control. Now, also, let's say in a professional sense. Here we go. So often, we're trying to control what we don't control. And this is in the book, I talk about this. This is kind of counterintuitive. We don't control the result. We control the process. So you all have a, have a great show. You do, you, no matter how great your show is, you don't actually control who tunes in and when. The only thing that's within your control is the type of show you produce, how well you prepare, the guests that you bring on. The process is in your control. And in my experience, if you want a certain result, the more you put in the process, the greater probability will be that you get the results you want. But trying to control the result at the expense of the process means that you actually have an unset expectation and, so and these it, are some examples of what you control and what you don't and the book has a great quote the process is the result yes that's the fortune yes. cookie like put over your fridge the process yes. is the result now I will, I will tell you when people come into hollywood devon right so i'm a little older than you but you've you've had a ton of experience in this business i will say to them like in the real world the laws of gravity apply if i throw this pen up in the air it's going to come down in Hollywood, the laws of gravity don't apply. I throw this pen up in the air. It's going to do a figure eight, spin around, go through the ceiling, come back around, you know, like, and, and so on. So talk about anyone who wants to get into show business or, you know, this part of the business or, or even being an influencer or whatever, like 
this advice is so spot on because talk about a business you have no control over the result, none. Right, and, and, and here's the other part where this gets really gets us. And this is what derails a lot of lives and a lot of careers is that trying to control the timing. So you talk about Hollywood, let's use it for an example. So every, people come to Hollywood, oh, I wanna make it, I wanna make it, I wanna make it. Great, nothing wrong with wanting to make it, nothing wrong with believing you have the talent. However, when we put a time clock on when it has to happen, and then if it doesn't happen by then, we start to judge ourselves, we start to say something's wrong, we start to get upset, we start to numb ourselves because we don't feel good. That's when it becomes destructive. So when you talk about Hollywood, here's what's in anyone's control, how they show up, how they prepare, their disposition, their attitude, their belief, right? It's okay to believe something that no one else believes about you. Nothing wrong with that. But don't let that belief become a burden. Let that belief remain a blessing. Let it continue to create joy. I talk about this in the book. How do you know if your expectation is working for you or against you? Is it creating more joy or more pain? If you have allowed your dream to be a source of pain, not joy, either you have the wrong dream or you're putting too much of an expectation on when that dream is supposed to manifest. Yeah. And, and I do think that like, if, if the process is the result, as you say in the book, and we can embrace that, that already I'm halfway home. <laughs> yeah. No, really. I'm making a movie with Jaden and Will, right? Like oh, I'm in, right. I'm China, which we know you had to have known by then. China is the future of right. filmmaking. Yeah. Totally. And, and I'm a baby, I'm 31, but I get it. Cause I'm, I've been just like you and I don't yeah. want to be like this anymore. Right, exactly. And, and the point you're hitting on is so important. The greatest catalyst for change in anyone's life is pain. Until we experience enough pain where we say what you just said, I don't want to be like this anymore. This book is really for those that are in pain because there are some that are not in enough pain yet. <laughs> I'm gonna sleep with it on my chest. <laughs> oh. So this message will not resonate because there's just not enough pain. It's like, all right, I can still deal in my life and I'm not totally happy, but I'm not you know, ready to make a change. But for those that are in so much pain that they yeah. cannot go on any longer the same way. This is your that, book. This book is the catalyst. But can we offer this to, because I always say like, um. People only learn from the lessons they pay for and they pay either with money or they pay in pain. Mm. But I always say like, there is that small percentage out there. My wife happens to be one of them. Like she always was like, if she met someone like you when she was younger, she'd be like, take all of your info. And she'd be like, he has the experience. I don't, I'm going to listen to him. Like mm. she wasn't one who had to go through a lot of pain. That's why she with her career anyway. Yeah. Because she listened to older people who went through the pain for her. I, I, I'm hoping, I guess, deep down that there could be a small group of people that like, if you're not in that pain now, take the lessons now if you're younger, because the pain's going to come later if you keep hanging everything on expectations. Yeah. So it's not yeah. just, you know, so I get it. Like, it sucks that we have to be brought to our knees. But man, don't I wish for a world where maybe we don't. And so my big thing is I have a lot of young people working for me and I'm always saying, I'm like, I don't want you to end up like me <laughs> crazy. at Like you can learn everything now. Just listen to me. you like, you, you don't yes. have to wait 25, 30 more years, you know? Anyway, that's me. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. I mean, you know, my, one of my uh, aunts, you know, great aunts, she would tell me you have to live it to learn it. I know. You know and, and a lot of times, you know, look, I, my hope, my deepest hope is that someone who's not in a tremendous amount of pain, would read this book and say, oh, okay. Preemptively, maybe, you know. Yeah, preemptively. Yeah, maybe preemptively avoid the pain yes. that expectations can, can create. But sometimes, um, independent of bumping our head, we may never, you know, get to the place we're supposed to be. Um, oh, this is a great one, guys. And again, this is good for young people to hear. And by the way, all people to, should hear this because – expectation without participation <laughs> equals devastation. Do you know what that means, Kelsey? Can you tell? No. Can you guess? Mm -mm. Expectation okay. without participation 
about doing the work. Okay. Equals devastation. In other words, for all those people on the bar stools, like I always say, I'm old. <laughs> they're not in bar stools anymore, but maybe they're in front of YouTube or they're in front of their video game. And they have these high expectations. Right. And they're not doing anything. But they're not participating yeah, yeah. in the process and the right. work. Right. But now they're devastated. How many people have to, are just devastated right. beca uh, because they weren't willing to participate? So, now, now, don't, that was my like layman's interpretation of this. Devon, you, you, you school us on that one. Yeah, no, I mean, there's a uh, scripture that says faith without works is dead. And so it's this idea that, you know, oh, okay, I'm just going to have these expectations. But I'm not going to participate in the process. I'm not going to evaluate if the expectation is set. I'm not going to work hard. I'm not going to discipline. I'm just going to have these expectations that this is what life is supposed to deliver. Yep. That's the danger in an expectation. It is a strong belief about what should happen. Should based on what? Based on what? So if, let's say you're talking about one of you know millennial you know becoming successful and wanting. Like, okay, well, where is it written that by 25, you should make six figures or you should be in the job of your dreams or you should be in a relationship that you really care about and that you love? Where is it written? It's not. It's not. So the idea of treating a possibility as a certainty is what is driving this generation crazy. Yes. It's nothing wrong with saying, oh, I'd like to. It would be great if, and I'm going to participate in the process because I know that'll help me potentially achieve the result. But to sit back and act like life is a genie or a vending machine, and all you got to do is just put in an expectation and it comes out. This is why so many people are secretly yes. desert. And, and by the way, I think it's all generations have these judgmental expectations. I, 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 I will say... Um, I feel like with the younger generation, I think a lot of expectations were met by parents and teachers. I don't think it was their fault. I think, you know, so, and now they're coming out to the real world, it doesn't work that way. You have to, right? You have to put in the work. It's, you know, it's not just going to happen. No, not. And, and, and honestly, I think sometimes parents and, um, you know, teachers can do, you know, to do people a disservice. Yeah. Uh, because life does not coddle you, it doesn't coddle me. No. <laughs> life is life. Yes. And the better, I think the better children and teenagers and, you know, young adults are prepared to deal with the realities of life, the better. And life is not going to give you what you want when you want it. Life is not going to always care about all the hard work you put in. It's not going to, it doesn't work that way. Life is about endurance. Life is about navigating the unexpected. Life is about appreciating the moment. And the more I believe that we practice those things, the better we are to succeed at life. Devon, can you give me some examples of like healthier expectations we can have? Yeah. So, so for example, of yourself, of myself, the healthier expectation is that I will achieve my dreams, but I'm not going to drive myself crazy about when they happen. I am on the path. So it's like, all right, we put the destination in Uber, right? We put the destination, excuse me, in, mm -hmm. in our, in our ways, right? Yep. Put the destination in. And what do you do? You drive. Okay, I'm going to get there. It tells me, yeah, okay, cool. I can I can relax. That's a great way to have a healthy expectation. I will be successful in this field. I will put in the time. I will continue to believe in my dream, but I'm going to relax and let it come to me when it's time. It will be revealed when it's time for me to leave this job or to push for the promotion as long as I stay easy about it. Here's another healthy expectation. I love, let's say you're in a marriage or relationship. Yeah, I want to ask about relationships. I love, I love my partner, but just because I love them and they love me doesn't mean that they know what it is I'm expecting. So a healthier expectation, instead of expecting, oh, they love me, they're supposed to know what I need. And if they don't know it, I'm not going to tell them because the fact that they don't know means they don't really love me. Those are all assumptions and mostly incorrect. A healthier expectation in a relationship is this. Whatever my needs are, one, I'm going to be in touch with those needs. Two, I will communicate. Communicate. With yes. Back to and that. Three, I will give the other person the opportunity to say yes or no about whether or not they can meet those needs. Too often, especially in a relationship or a marriage, we have these expectations that this person is supposed to be our everything. They're supposed to make us happy. 
they're supposed to read our mind and we want to know why we're not happy is because we have an unhealthy expectation of the person that we're with. A healthy expectation is I'm not going to ask you to do anything for me. I don't do for myself. And I am not going to try to put you in a prison of, of my expectation. Here's what I'd like. If you want to do that, great. If not, let me know. Maybe I'm supposed to get that need met in another way. Here's the other thing I'll say about this real quick, which is this idea, oh, this person makes me happy. This is a toxic idea to me. Ooh. Why? Because anyone that makes you, when you talk about making, that means creating. So anyone we allow to create happiness in us, we are outsourcing the fact that we should be the creator of our happiness. I believe others can contribute to our happiness, but not make us happy. Because the same person that makes you happy is the same person that's going to make you sad. You know, I think it's just how do I adapt and how do I adjust? Change is inevitable. Growth is optional. Change is inevitable. Growth is optional. Wow. I love that. That's a great quote. Write that down. I love that. You know, Last time we spoke, Trevor, we didn't talk about visualization, and it is a part of your kind of teaching and your philosophy. Can you share how you instruct people on visualization? Yeah, to, to me, it's it's a, a more advanced skill, but it's a, an important skill. You know, what it allows you to do is to um, see yourself as if you can already perform something you haven't quite mastered you know and, and it became real popular in the you know in the 50s 60s and 70s during the cold war uh in the former soviet union at their olympic training camps uh called psycho cybernetics and this sort of cybernetic which sounds like a schwarzenegger like a terminator <laughs> sabadon system cybernetics uh but it, it's it's essentially um your mind can't distinguish between a real experience and an imagined one, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that goes back to, you know, you're at school um, and all of a sudden you, you jump and you thought you fell down a cliff and you didn't. So when we learn how to, through eidetic imagery or guided imagery or progressive muscle relaxation, so a lot of times as we advance with our teams, we'll lay our guys back, squeeze your feet four seconds, relax them, Squeeze your calves, four seconds, relax them. Squeeze your quads, four seconds, relax them. And then, you know, we'll regulate, breathe in for four, uh, four seconds, hold it for four seconds, release it for four seconds. And then as I'll start playing crowd noise. And then at playing the crowd noise, and then first person, present tense, first quarter, all right? And then kind of take the next three or four minutes, play through your specifics. See yourself grabbing the ball, see yourself, you know, all the different types of things first person present tense before we go to the youth world cups back in the days with the freddie adus and josie altadors i take the guys to the beach and i uh we lay down i play the national anthem with crowd noise before the kids are getting ready to go play in mexico or in central america it's uh it's like a vividly primer. imagining an experience in advance of that experience happening so um it, it can happen you know uh through uh relaxing your muscles, regulating your breathing, then uh, walking yourself like a golfer. You know, I've had golfers who, you know, keep slicing off the tee. And then we go through, you know, the mental rehearsal. And as they mentally rehearse it, they slice off the tee. So until we can fix it in their mind, mm -hmm. they're, they're never going to be able to go out in the course and do it. So 10 perfect ones, 10 perfect free throws, uh, you know, see yourself as you step up to that presentation, confident, you look down to your hands, you look at your note cards, um, you look at uh, your skin, you look at the, you know, the, the more you can reinforce it. So <clears throat> the best example of it is the matrix. I mean, the, the, the matrix built a whole trilogy on the idea of cybernetics. You know, I, I remember that scene, I remember showing the Jacksonville Jaguars this, where um, uh, Neo, um, which was Lawrence Fishburne, and uh, and then Keanu and he's and he's like, like where are we? We're inside a computer program. That, like is this isn't real? And he said, you know what is real? Mm -hmm. All real is is electrical signals interpreted by your brain. And I sound like the total American, 
right quoting matrix on a great program like better together but <laughs> it was a, a great metaphor that you could live a whole life through your subconscious mm -hmm. and never really tell the difference so um but you know maria i always go back to it you know how i am that focusing on the subconscious uh programming ad campaigns like just do it from nike or i take setbacks as temporary i bounce back quickly i feel healthy i do you know uh, i stay on top of my health uh, with rigor with passion with persistence like all of those things are powerful but they don't matter if we don't watch what we internally consume mm -hmm. tv wise our remote what we say out loud you know all the basic fundamentals and i've always felt like the self-esteem movement a personal development movement has gone too quick to the subconscious and not focused enough on the conscious what we verbalize what we watch where i think the real power is yeah i think that's kind of like step one you got to clean all that out first got to clean all of that up to which is so much like i control what i say mm -hmm. you know i i control what i say and and, it, and 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 so i think that that's you know really really important that well, idea of um you know I, I can do this i can manage this i i have some control of my life maybe not as much as i had nine months ago in some ways mm -hmm. but uh you know in other ways i still do i like when people are like i can do hard things <laughs> like that makes me feel better and I, I have to say what you're talking about, we've talked a lot about on this show at different times with um, the studying of Esther Hicks, where it's like you have to envision what you want and feel it as, it, as if it's happening currently to you and celebrate as if it's currently happening to you in order for you to manifest it into your life. And so for Kevin, someone like Kevin, who's like a dude, like a real dude, He's not going to connect with an Esther Hicks like I do, but your way he can connect to a lot easier. Yours is more relatable. So I'm sure, Kev, just hearing Trevor say that, it connects with you a little bit more because we'll get to um, language and how important language is because I feel like you know, there are a lot of self-fulfilling prophecies, whether it's like, I'm never going to have the career I want, or I'm never going to be successful, or I'm never, my time has passed, I'm too old. There's so many of those things that you hear people say, and then you're just contributing to the end result that you're, you're prophesizing. Right. Um, and, and I think where I might relate to Kevin more is, you know, like I've told you there, there are no Tony Robbins in sports. You know, like athletes aren't looking for self-help. Uh, it hasn't grown the industry of sports psychology really um, because the expectation is the expectation. This is the quality standard. You meet it or you go. Yep. You know, and there's the article recently on Russell Wilson spending a million dollars on his body and his mind a year. And, and you have LeBron and you've got a handful of guys, TB12, mm -hmm. right? Guerrero, uh, Alex Guerrero, I think, and, and Tom Brady. Uh, but for the most part, you know, it's just like, there's not a lot of resources you get in and you perform. Um, and then to some degree, you you might grab somebody like me and a few others that, hey, that makes sense. Uh, or a Nick Saban's gonna say, hey, you're gonna be a part of our program. This year, I've spent a lot of time with Michigan State football um, and uh, you know, really focusing on, you know, right now we're focusing on like, how do you be consistent? We just beat Michigan and then we just lost to Iowa. And it's kind of part of that journey of um, if I'm good enough to do it sometimes, why am I not good enough to do it all the time? You know, and we all we all fight that battle in our lives. And that's the difference between unconscious competence and conscious competence. And unconscious competence is, hey, Kevin, you were amazing. Uh, you 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 uh, had an incredible performance. This is what you did with Maria's career and After Buzz and all the different things that you've done in L.A. What do you attribute your success to? Hey man, I got no idea. Maybe like a neap tide or like earthworms. I mean, I got, you know, like that's not a good answer, you know, rather than, well, this is, we did this, this, and this, this is what we did with Maria. This is how we, like, that's a good answer, you know, um, and in that constant evolution, you know, Russell can have five touchdowns and explain why. And then he can also, you know, have two, two interceptions and explain why. Yeah. You know, and not be afraid of it, but own it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kev, what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, I go back to Cam Newton because I do. I've been watching him very closely every game. And you mentioned the game with him against Russell. To me, that was the two best quarterbacks in football in that moment. In that moment. In that moment. And I think, but his, I think that him being 16 and 0 his first season, I remember when he lost that Super Bowl. I remember telling my father in law, because I've been a fan from day one. And I remember telling my father in law, I said, someone's got to get with this kid. Yep. Because he's never going to recover. Yeah. And unfortunately, I was right. Yeah. And then if you watch the first, few games of the Patriots, even Tony Romo was saying like, Hey, wait a second. We, we shouldn't be counting out these Patriots. And he gave them a dynamic they never had before. They never had a guy who could run. They never had a guy who, who was more of a, um, he was actually better for the millennials. If I may go out on a limb, I don't know the infrastructure as much, but as an outsider, it seems like he was better with the young receivers where Tom intimidated them. Right. Mom was just like, bring your A game and shut up. Whereas this guy wrapped his arms around them and was like, it's going to be okay. I've been through it. And then COVID happened. And I feel like he just spiraled again. And I feel 100% mental coaching is you're scratching the surface, Trev. It's going to get so much bigger because millennial culture and Gen Z culture demands it. I I do agree that. I I mean, I, I definitely agree with that, particularly Gen Z culture, um, you know, which I've been learning a lot more about generation Z of late, which Generation Z seems to be more of a going back to a little bit of toughness and some of those other areas, but it needs a lot of inclusion and it yeah. needs, it's, you know, asks a lot of questions, you know? So, um, no, I, I, I to, to Maria's point, um, you know, I, I just think simplicity for the vast majority of our country, we're looking for answers that can help us right now, you know, um, and um, language and, and uh, habits and behaviors, you know, um, you know, all that stuff, you know, can happen right now. And when I go back to Cam, I remember when we were at the pro day or not the pro day, but the combine. And, um, you know, at night he would come to my room and we would go through very specific things for the press conferences and, and he's all in. And then, you know, the day that he threw, um, you know, he missed three or four throws, but they focused heavily on that. Um, and I just remember when he had his pro day in Auburn, um, you know, he, he's a big time player who performs in, in big time moments that Super Bowl, you know, you had the ultimate contrast the year before Russell throws that huge interception yeah. and they, you know, he comes out in his press conference devastated, but they said, you know, Hey, Pete Carroll said it was his fault. Russell said, balls in my hand. It was my fault, but I like the way we attacked it. The approach, we got all the way down, got to the one yard line got to give Tom Brady, got to give the Patriots credit, give Malcolm Butler as a heck of a play that next year, you know, Cam just walked out of the press conference and he says, you show me, you show me a good loser. I'll show you a loser. And who's right or who's wrong. But that's why I always say for those who vent out a lot of negativity, Hey, I just need to vent it. There's no science that supports venting as being good or bad. It just, it's a lot of negativity and the organization and cam never moved on from that moment um, where Russell by handling it, how he did helped the organization start down the path. Ooh, good you know, point. And, so then for the everyday yeah, person think- who feels like they're venting, um, you know, cause sometimes I'll say to Kevin, I just need to vent for a second. What is the alternative? Um, how do you well, handle I, all those emotions I, you need to let out? I, I still think it goes back to um, discipline to not say anything in that moment, but to step away, you know, breathe, you know, just, just um, it, it's like, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a sporting event, you make a mistake and you come to the sideline. There's a moment where you can vent, throw your helmet, do all those other things, or just, you know, sit down and start working through, the truth in your mind. Um, it like, that's to me, there's no judgment. There's no right or wrong, but if negativity is 40 to 70 times more powerful, as we verbalize it, you have made it significantly more uh, challenging for yourself to move on. Mm. Doesn't mean, and, and that might be okay, but if you didn't say it or you went to, all right, this is not going the way I want to go. Like um, how, and, and not trying to be positive, Maria, because positive at that point, 
will feel inauthentic. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not ready to move to that place, you know, but not going to negative, just being like, all right, that sucked. All right. What I like, I, I, what do I need to do? All right. I'm, I'm on NFL, the grind. This is, this is the piece I'm working on. How do we finish this thing strong? Mm. You know, or, or, and, and then just go to the truth sucked. What do I need to do now? There's nothing wrong with just saying, God dang it. I could be so much better. And then just getting there quicker. Interesting. You know, yeah. But because if you, wrong, if like, you, um, I wouldn't confront somebody for venting. Yeah. Cause if you swim in the negative, you're not going to come to the solution. Right. You're just adding just, fuel to the fire. It's too powerful. Yeah. It's just, it's, it, you know, it's rather too than powerful. thinking, That's what's why... the solution? How can I turn this around? Right. And then, you know, but the first step, like we said, is just, you know, like we told our players, as crazy as it sounds, stop saying stupid things out loud. You know, like, because that's all you can prove is that hurts you. Mm -hmm. Saying great things out loud, there's no proof that that helps you. So remember, so much of what defines a great performer in the world, in your industry, in the medical community, in the pharmaceutical community, in the flooring community, in the athletic world, in the special operations community, is not what he or she does, it's what they're willing not to do. What they're willing not to watch, what they're willing not to eat, who they're willing not to engage with. You know, um, because a lot of times in life we can't make things better in the short term, but we can make them a lot worse. I love that. Just like such a switch of perspective. What am I willing not to do to be greater? You know, even on the show every day, we're bringing in experts like you, Trev, to make us better. But sometimes focusing on all the improvements we have to make can be overwhelming. So rather than focusing on all these improvements we have to make, maybe we we focus on the things that we can do, the things that we won't do anymore that will add up to, to better results. Like even this morning, I was thinking, wow, I wonder how quitting soda has affected me, right? That was something I was willing not to do anymore. Um, And so that yields a result rather than saying the opposite, right? Like I have to do all these things to stay healthy and whatever. I was like, let me just remove this. Yeah, and 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 think about that. I was watching something with Brendan Burchard or one of those top self-esteem and he was talking about, you know, getting up and journaling and doing all these things and and all things that are really good. But I was thinking about the community that I've served, like our guys aren't gonna do that ever. Mm-hmm ever <laughs> in bed for 30 minutes and journaling yeah. never happening the odds of me ever doing that no shot <laughs> right but there are a lot of things i cannot do yeah you know and and, and i think if if people listening to the show identified the five things that they could not do right now that could immediately change their life that would be a powerful starting point this podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or MariaMenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. Program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menunos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menunos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.